everyone and welcome to our Parenting Ideas Educator webinar, Making Restorative Justice Work with Adam Voigt. In today's webinar, you'll learn how to nimbly deploy restorative practices in the heat of the school day. You'll learn how to teach critically important capabilities, including empathy, respect and responsibility. And you'll gain a full understanding of the important role of emotions in the learning environment and so much more. I'm Dr. Jane Richardson and I'm your webinar host for today. I'd like to let you know that the, a link to this recording will arrive in your inbox in, your inbox in the coming days. Uh, all microphones are on mute so that the webinar room stays lovely and quiet. And if you have any questions for Adam or for me, you can do so in the webinar uh, dashboard in the questions drop down menu. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest webinar presenter for today, Adam Voigt. Adam shares critical messages about schools, culture, leadership and learning and elevates action in the education system through his groundbreaking business, Real Schools. He's the resident education expert for Channel 10's The Project, which must be a lot of fun, Adam. <laughs> he's also he's an international speaker, he's an author and he's sharing us his expertise and wisdom with us today. We're very grateful. It's great to see you, Adam. Thank you so much for having me, Jody. As I've mentioned in our prep for today, this is my, my favourite topic to talk about. So uh, I'm looking forward to speaking to your people about, about restorative practice. Oh, thank you very much. Well, let's get started, shall we? So I'm going to start by launching a poll. And uh, this way, this will give you some an opportunity to give a little bit of information about uh, some of the, some of the uh, ways uh, in which restorative practice will make a difference for, for our educators listening today. So what would make the biggest difference to your school's culture is our poll question to kick things off. So if you can please take a moment to vote, just choosing one. And uh, when we've got about 80% of people voted, we'll be able to get moving. Fantastic, we're underway with votes. So collecting responses and yeah, just waiting for a handful more people to vote, please. Thanks, everyone. It's wonderful to have so many of you with us here this afternoon to learn about uh, restorative practices. All right, brilliant. Okay. All right, there we go. We have 80% of people have voted now, which is fantastic. So I'm going to share those results with you. Oh, interesting. There we go. I'll, I'll leave that with you, Adam. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> All right, fabulous. Well, I might get you, um, Jody, to hide those results now if you can. And I think then what I'm able to do is to share my screen for people and we can, we can get started. So that notion that's come through there very strongly is around consistency. Um, I, it's, it's funny and that's probably the one that I anticipated would come back the strongest, res strongest response. I think that it makes sense to people that if you are going to achieve improvements in tricky areas like behaviour and like engagement and like student and teacher wellbeing, that consistency of the way we work is really important. Um, I would contend it's one area that we've gotten wrong though in schools over quite a period of time. I also contend that we've gotten the implementation of restorative practices wrong in a lot of our schools over the years because we've sought for consistency over outcome. And I think where that's led a lot of schools to is to try to control the outcome of various behaviours and behaviour doesn't like to be controlled that way. Uh, what I mean by that is that you can create a situation very easily where we're targeting consistency, where we might develop a behaviour chart. Uh, because what we'd like to do is to be consistent about the way we respond to behaviour. So we design a chart that has all of the behaviours in there and say this is what the response will be if it is, for instance, a tier one, a tier two, a tier three, or a tier four behaviour. So we might say, we could get really complicated with these charts. We can say that you know, punching, for instance, is a tier three behaviour. Um, if someone were to punch, um, then a tier, three, a tier three response is deployed, which might include a couple of detentions, it could be a, a phone call home, um, and it may become more severe, for instance, if it's tier three behaviour repeated a second time, we might up the ante on that. Um, the problem we've got there is that there's punching, and then there's punching. 
So what I mean by that is that there's the sort of punch that genuinely does damage to somebody's face, and that's something that we should be responding to uh, appropriately to the harm that's being caused. Um, but then there's a the sort of punch that I could walk past even a student as a teacher and give them a, a gentle nudge on the shoulder and say, I really like what you're doing there. And I just got to hope that student isn't the sort of student who says, oh, that's a tier three behaviour. You're in so much trouble. Um, and all of a sudden, we are not being consistent because we're not paying attention to context. Uh, context is the greatest driver of the, of the choices that an adult or a child will, will, choose, to, will, will choose to deploy a behaviour. Um, so to disregard it, we do so at our own peril. What we say in a restorative model is let's get consistent, not about outcome, but about process. What's the process that we deploy whenever there's conflict or tension in our school? And that's when we start to make a fundamental shift in terms of what's possible. So I get you here today on a little bit of false promise um, in that I, I, we've got a, a webinar title today around making restorative justice work. Um, and the word justice I'm going to unpack in a minute because it's actually not what I'm talking about today. Um, I'm talking about practice. And what you can see even in the picture that's in the screen here is me, that, that's uh, me in my suit there with a group of year six students in country Victoria, um, running what we call a learning circle. And I'm gonna to talk to those um, towards the end of the webinar today. Um, and there are two things happening for me here. Number one is that I feel that I'm driving a high level of student engagement. If you look around the circle there, you can see that quite a, quite a high number of those students are engaged. It's not perfect. There's a little fellow just a couple of spots to my right who you know, just seems to be struggling to join in the circle the same way that everyone else is. So we're not chasing perfection. We're chasing the creation of, the like, of, of, a, of an environment, a context, if you will, where the right kind of behaviours are most likely. Um, it's not perfect working restoratively, but for me, it's done two really clear things. Number one is that restorative practices allows me to feel more effective. I genuinely feel like I get somewhere in my teaching when I choose to sit the students, for instance, in a circle like this and take what we call an authoritative rather than, author rather than an authoritarian position. Um, that's because we're now doing education together rather than choosing an architecture for my lesson that says, I'm gonna try and do education to you. Um, when we do education together, I believe um, incredibly firmly that the students learn more and that they produce more. And so I feel as a teacher that I go home every day when I've practiced restoratively, I feel more effective. Um, I like that. The other thing that restorative practices does for me is it allows me to feel less stressed. Um, and I think the thing that stresses teachers most is when they feel an incongruence between their purpose and their practice. I think that we feel a sense of shame. Um, we feel a sense of frustration when we believe certain things about working with young people, but our lessons, but our classrooms, but our conduct, but our practice doesn't back that up. We feel like we did something else. We feel like we lost a bit of control. We feel like it just, I just didn't live that out in my work today. And it stresses me when I feel that. So what I love about working restoratively is that that stress is reduced. I think that every teacher having the ambition of being more effective and less stressed is a worthy ambition. And that's why I am talking to you today, today about practice over justice. Why do I want to? Why do I want to make that distinction in terms of um, in, in terms of working restoratively? I think justice gives us the idea that we're looking to only respond once the student has done something wrong. I think that it's a way of doling. I think it conjures images of doling out justice. Of uh, it conjures images of a judicial system. Of somehow what we do is we get together and we talk about what went wrong. And sure, you can do that in a restorative model, but I just don't think that's where its immense power is as, a, as, a, as an educator. I just don't think having a new way to deal with conflict, tension and poor behaviour choices when they happen is going to improve my effectiveness and reduce my stress levels. I need more for that to be the case. And what restorative practices has done for me has allowed me to get really clear about my practice, to get explicit about my practice, to have a plan for my practice that sits really closely to my purpose. Um, and I love that about it. I absolutely love that about it. So what's the 
what's the plan? I guess what you might be wondering. If your school was looking to get explicit about practice, and boy, we get explicit about many things in education. So if you want to have a plan for that, well, sorry, there, it's just jumped ahead on me for some reason. Um, if you want to have a plan for education, then we, we call that a curriculum. So that's a plan for what we're going to teach but it's not a plan for how we're going to teach. And what I believe practicing restoratively does is establish for me a plan for how I'm going to teach. So I work backwards a little bit in, in building that plan. And I say to myself, well, what do I actually want the way that I conduct myself? What do I want the way that I practice? Um, what, do I want, how, what do I want the choices about how I, how I work? What do I want that to achieve? And for me, what I want that to achieve is those last few lines on this little page here that says building healthy relationships and stronger school communities. I think that the healthy relationships part is the process bit. I think the stronger school communities is the output, is the outcome bit. And I think too many schools jump to the outcome and say that we can achieve that quickly. We look to establish strong school communities with events. So we might invite people in for a fete or a, for a, um, a teacher, a students as teachers evening or a, you know, some sort of social gathering um, and hope that yes, because we got the community together that they're a community. But I don't think we stop often enough to say, you know, what is a community? And I, um, I've come to the belief that a community is just a big nebulous bundle of relationships. And if you can make those relationships healthy, then as a result, you will get a strong school community. And for me, that's what restorative practices does. What I'm trying to do when I talk about practicing explicitly is first understand that there's a restorative framework at play here. And there are two parts to that that I'm going to reference if I may very quickly today. Sorry, they've just got a little bit of a slide mess function here that seems to be skipping ahead on me. Um, the first part is about, is about understanding that there's a restorative framework that's part of that explicit practice intention. There's a continuum that runs from informal to formal. I'm going to touch today upon a very small part of that continuum called effective language. Um, it's awesome <laughs> and it's easy. And so it creates for me, I think, the very first starting point around working restoratively. The danger in something so ridiculously easy is that you're going to forget it really easily um, as well. And so I'm going to, to, to make a point of that as we move forward as well. Um, and then within that framework, and I won't get to this one today, is around the operating domains. And the operating domains is a way of reflecting. Now, most educators tell me that it's important in terms of being a professional educator to reflect. And I would suggest that most of us don't reflect adequately. What I mean by that is I think that we judge rather than reflect. Reflection should be an act of adjustment, not an act of judgment. Um, what it means is when you reflect, you should change something. It's the same as when you get up in the mirror, you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you decide whether you, you know, uh, for me, it's shaving or whether it's putting on makeup for somebody else or doing your hair or all three, I'm really not sure. Um, any of those things that you decide to do when you're staring into the mirror is about adjustment. You look at where you, what you've done on one side and you try to make the other side even out. Um, and so you adjust until you get a product that you go, yeah, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with that. And that's what reflection should do. Uh, I reflect on how firm and fair I've been. And that's what the operating domain is all about. It said, how, does, how, how do we get a good balance between firm and fair? And I reflect on it every time I teach. Um, the way that I teach, uh, whether I'm, um, teaching in the classrooms or whether I'm delivering professional learning, I'll stop and when I get to my car, the habit I've created is, to, is when I get to my car, I have to reflect for 10 seconds. I mean, was I too firm or was I too fair? Did I smash those people with this really difficult concept today or did I over support them and not challenge them enough? Yeah, okay, I think in this part of the day's training, if I created another, another discussion opportunity, that would be a supportive, that would be a fair thing to do. Yeah, okay, if I do that, then I've got my balance a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, good, and I drive off. Um, but I think if most of us were to reflect, what we do is get out to the car and we stop and go, how was I today? And we say, oh, I sucked. And we drive off. And unfortunately, whether that's true or not, nothing changes. Um, of course, we could reflect incredibly positively. We could get out to the car in the afternoon and say, you know, I was fantastic. And again, nothing changes. There's no adjustment that's that's involved when we judge. So if you're going to reflect, I think you need a mirror. 
and that operating domains notion of being firm and fair is one that I'm certainly happy to send some people some additional information about that after the webinar today and I'll give you some contact details that you can use to get that if that sounds like a good plan for you. The other parts of the explicit practice framework are understanding how you create that fair process and we talk about three specific E's in that space. Uh, their engagement, uh, expect uh, expectation clarity and explanation and when you get those things in, pra in place you do some really fabulous things for the kids and I will engage because the, their belief in our literature and the literature and the research that sits behind practicing restoratively tells us that people will cop an unfair outcome but only if you got there a fair way. So that first E of the fair process, we call that engagement, um, and that means there's a fundamental shift to be made whenever there are two people in conflict in your classroom. So if you had two students come in and you, um, and you could tell that one was pretty much what we might call uh, in victim mode and one was probably a perpetrator, you, sometimes you have those assumptions that we make as we walk towards the students. Um, our compulsion is usually to go to the victim first because they look so sad. Our feelings are driving our decision making, not the, not the wonderful neocortex of our brain that's so good at thinking. In a restorative model, we go to the perpetrator first. Um, not because we're going to believe every word they say, but because we need them engaged. It's hard to repair relationship when half of the people completely disengage because we listened to the sob story of the victim first. The way that victims and perpetrators want to be heard when there's conflict is first of all to understand that they both want to be heard, but there's a difference in the way they respect order. Um, perpetrators want to be heard first. Um, victims just want to be heard. Get to me at some stage and I'm cool. And, um, and that's a really important shift to make in a restorative model. There's also a set of restorative questions that you can ask, um, but what I'm actually not going to provide them to you today for, for a real reason, for a very clear and deliberate reason. Um, and that is that too many people take the restorative questions that are, that are really clever in design and they put them uh, like a business card in a lanyard and whenever a student walks past them in the, in the yard and does something wrong, they stop them and pull the question card out of their lanyard, waste 15 seconds getting it out because it's been humid and sticky and they can't quite get there. Before they know it, the kid's rolling their eyes, doesn't want to be involved in this. And then we go, what happened? Well, hang on. I, we don't need to do that. I actually just saw you push somebody. You know? So we don't need to ask that question. Too many people use the questions as a script, not as a guide. There's a function for these questions. What do they do? What's the, what's the function? They just take you from past to present to future. And that's a really worthy and a really nimble way to go about problem solving. You're like, hey, what was that all about when you pushed that kid? How do you think you've made him feel when you did that? What do you think you need to do to take responsibility for that and make it right again? It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. And I don't mind what questions you use that allow you to quickly and effectively move from past to present to future. So those questions that you can find on, on, on a lot of cards around the place are just, uh, are just there as a bit of a backup for you. And then there's the notion of the theory and the research. I want to talk briefly today to the theory that we need to change model. Um, I'm going to suggest to you some ways you can start doing that through the practice in your language. Um, but the truth is, if you want to get the real benefit from practicing restoratively, you've got to change your mind. Um, there are some things that we learned about being a teacher the moment that we all, as four year olds, stepped into classrooms. We started to commit to memory what teachers do, and most of them are relics of the adversarial system. I'll unpack that for you in just a moment. And the thing that I the reason, one of the reasons I advocate so, so strongly for working restoratively is that little nasty word that's the last picture, the last one on this page around shame. Um, this isn't a hypothetical construct, so this isn't another program that we're asking you to implement. Um, this is a different way of doing what you're already doing. And the research is that, that's been used has not been a bunch of people sitting around working for a large edu company deciding what's the next program we'd like schools to buy all the resources from. Um, this is this is an approach built on a deep body of research around human affect and the human brain, um, in particular the way we experience shame. Uh, one study I saw recently said that 80% concluded that 80% of the student behaviours that were of concern in the classroom could be directly attributed to a sense of academic failure. When, when we feel 
the sting of shame when we fail, when we get a sense that the classroom is a place that we fail, we wreck things. And we would like to have to educate us to be aware that that's what's going on here, that this, what you're eliciting, what you're seeing here is a shame response. If we can understand that our responses are so, so much clever. So the aim of any relational practice is to understand that whenever we, what we're looking to do is to use restorative approaches whenever we get conflict or tension. Um, and we're going to expect it because let's be really honest, you're all a little bit nuts. You decided <laughs> that you were going to work and try and try to achieve consistency in an environment with several hundred young people whose brains are not finished yet. And then you decided to try and work in collaboration with the people who have the most emotional connections to them, their parents. We are going to get some conflict and tension and we're saying we've got our way ready of dealing with that. Uh, and our way is going to be to focus on repairing harm. So this is the difference between punching and punching is that they, cre they create and produce for people different levels of harm. Where there's no harm, there's very little work that needs to be done. I don't need to be following through on a student who's been given a little tap and said, you know, well, well done, that's great. And if you go, ah, but that was a punch, that deserves two lunch times and a phone call home. I don't need to be doing that, there's no harm here. But where the harm is extreme, where the harm is really severe, we want a way of dealing with that. And when it's moderate, we want a way that's consistent, that, that, that applies these principles of the way we work, right, right up and down the spectrum, from the small and, in, and um, informal actions, all the way through to the serious and formal actions that we want to take. We want to be consistent of approach. And we say that we're going to repair, we're going to repair harm because it re-strengthens the relationship. It's about rebuilding relationships. And I think that in this current age of social media, that's that's more important now than ever before. Uh, social media, by its very nature, encourages us to make and break friendships really easy, easily. Uh, for our teenagers, if somebody were to post an embarrassing photo, for instance, somebody's mother posts an embarrassing photo of a, a of their 16-year-old daughter as a four-year-old who was sitting on the toilet. Um, if we're not wanting to be associated with that embarrassing moment, we don't actually go and talk to that person and help them or you know, give them a hand. We click unfriend. And for our poor young people, it means that several relationships that they thought they had and valued can end while they're asleep. They just didn't even know that all of a sudden it's over and I'm some sort of social pariah. Um, we need to train our young people not to treat life like social media. We need to treat, train them that when something's wrong in a relationship, we fix it, we restore it. Um, it may not be the same as it was previously, but just like when we restore an old favourite armchair, we can make it stronger, we can make it functional, we can make it better than the condition that it was in by going to the effort of restoring it, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, the basic tenets of working restoratively, like I said a minute ago, is that we focus on harm and relationships. Now, if we were to compare that to the previous approach, which is about the, the adversarial and blame-based approach, which says that we're going to ask questions like what happened, who's to blame, and what punishment or sanctions needed. So we're going to do things like, if I mentioned, as I mentioned before, those two students that come in that are, um, you know, you've got a, you know, somebody who's a typical perpetrator and you've got someone who's a typical victim. As we walk towards them, if we make the mistake of letting our feelings talk for us, then we'll go to the victim and we'll say, what happened? And then we'll go, oh, no. He didn't. Oh, no, that's awful. You're kidding me. Oh, sorry, he did, he did that too. That, that is terrible. And then we stare at the perpetrator and we say, is that right? At this point, that student block, drops out of the relation, drops out of the, um, drops out of the conversation. And again, like I said, very difficult to restore that relationship if half the people aren't there. So what we do is we go straight to the perpetrator and we ask them, we ask what happened just to get them involved. But if I use the old model, I ask what happened. I don't get my, I get a great story from the victim. Um, you get a feeling it's not, it's somewhat embellished. I get nothing from the perpetrator. So then I start to launch what I call educational CSI, which means I start to call witnesses. I stare at another kid on the table and say, you were there, you tell me what happened. They don't give you anything because they just don't want to lose a friendship out of this. So then you've got to call in Emily the Dobber from across the, co the corridor who will come in and tell you, blow by blow exactly what happened between these two students, reinforcing for everybody in the classroom that it's dangerous to be friends with Emily. And we've got to ask ourselves what we do with that information. So when I first walked up to those students, 
I thought, I reckon it's 80% this perpetrator, but this victim does a little bit of sort of poking the bear out there. Uh, through my witnesses, I was able to fluctuate up to 90, 10, and then back down to about 60, 40, but Emily kind of set me straight in the end, and I've spent an hour, but I've ended up exactly back where I started at 80, 20. And I asked myself, what do I do? with that 80-20 split when it comes along, well, I've got to hand out a punishment or sanction. So I look at the perpetrator and I say, look, I'm sorry, but you know this is three times in the last four weeks. I, I'm not going to be dealing with this anymore. Anyway. Enough's enough. And I say, that'll be two detentions. I will be calling your mother down for a meeting. And then I say to the other student, and you, with all the little muttering under your breath that triggered this, you're on a warning. I'm watching you. And I walk away and I say, good teacher. Um, now, you would probably agree that what I'm trying to do when I intervene in this way is that I'm looking to deter the behaviour from happening again. Um, there's a problem here, is that only thinking can drive a shift in behaviour. And I can prove that to absolutely everybody who's on the webinar today. Uh, I can prove it by saying to, you that no, saying, proving to you that none of you woke up this morning accidentally on a diet. None of you accidentally ate half a grapefruit for breakfast because I cannot work out why you would do that. They're, that, they're disgusting. Um, you've got to think about that first. So you may have sat up late one night and watched a bad infomercial for the Nutra Smasher bullet thing or whatever it is. Um, you may have then said, right, I'll, I'll let you've opened your Facebook account perhaps and you've seen a photo of yourself six years ago. Uh, Facebook's great like that, isn't it? You think, oh, I've put on a couple of kilos since that photo, haven't I? And then you're in the supermarket. And in your hand, left hand, you have a grapefruit. In your right hand, you have a box of Cocoa Pops. You think, no, and you put the Cocoa Pops back on the shelf. And only after all that thinking does the, the, the behaviour of what you eat for breakfast change. Um, if that stands to reason for you, I wonder if it stands to reason to you that positive thinking has a better chance of leading to a positive behaviour shift. And that thereby negative thinking also has a better chance of leading towards a negative behaviour shift. And if we believe that and we think about what does the perpetrator think at the moment that I hand out two detentions and, a, and, a, and the instruction that I'll be calling a parent, um, I reckon under their breath or in their neocortex, they're thinking, I hate this bloke. He's always picking on me, he never actually listens to me just because goody two-shoes over here chucks on the waterworks. I'll fix him up. I saw which car he drives in. That's for this bitch. I'll be getting her when I get out. Yeah, and so they think these really nasty things and basically what we do is give them two detentions to plot, re plot revenge. Likely to lead to a positive behaviour shift? I, I don't think so. Um, and then we think about the, the, the perceived victim here who was doing a little bit of um, bear poking. I wonder what they're thinking at the moment. And I think it's something along the lines of, <laughs> look at look how well I played this. Unlikely to lead to a positive behaviour shift for that student as well. So we're at a really important fork in the road. We can say, I need to try harder at this system. I need to launch longer investigations and I need to look for higher levels of punishment to use here in order for this system to work. Or we can say, you know what, I've had enough. Um, I want a new system. And the new system that I'm advocating to you today is what we call the restorative system, which says just ask some different questions. Ask what happened, what harm has been... Sorry, guys, I've just got an issue with that slide deck changing automatically on me, but we'll deal with it. Um, ask what happened, what harm has resulted, and what needs to be done to make things right again. And if you can stick to that basic approach um, and work on it with consistency, work on it with your colleagues and find really clever ways to make it work for your context, uh, to use it creatively, then I think that you can start to build exactly what JD said when she um, introduced the webinar. You can start to build empathy because the students start to think about the way behaviour affects other people. You can start to build respect because respect is built in relationships when we're able to have high expectations and high levels of support, when we're firm and fair in the way we treat each other. And you can start to build responsibility because responsibility is not built on knowing about responsibility. So you can run a mini lesson if you wish on a Thursday afternoon about responsibility and we can say to ourselves, great, our students should now be able to be responsible. It doesn't work like that. Um, the only way that you learn how to become responsible is to, uh, the only way that you learn about responsibility is to take it. And this model allows our students a wonderful opportunity to practice taking it. The previous model denies them that responsibility. When you're sitting in a detention for two days, um, you, get, you get to fix nothing um, apart from build a Machiavellian plan for revenge. 
um, we need a better way. And um, my experience has been certainly as a as a teacher and a school leader that this way works incredibly well for me. Let me pull it apart for you a fraction further. The adversarial models has a, has a distinct focus on the past, which is a, a problem for us. I know this is going to change again, isn't it? <laughs> Recovered. Um, a distinct focus on the past. We go back, 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 back through educational CSI uh, because our preoccupation in that model is on blame. And the underpinning belief of that approach is that deterrence is linked to punishment. If I can get my blame split right, uh, and if I can then punish accordingly, or severely enough that I will deter this behaviour from happening again. Now, if that served in terms of human behaviour, um, the most severe punishment would deter even the most severe crime on a collective scale. So even the death penalty, as severe as that punishment is, the death penalty for violent crime in the United States should be reducing the violent crime rate in the United States. I wonder if you can think about how well that's working out for them. Um, I know why we do it, because the punishment model um, in terms of deterrence is fantastic while the punishment is taking place. It's a brilliant preventative model, because let's be honest, once you have seen the, have met the electric chair, you commit no more violent crimes, it's true. And once the student, as I mentioned before, is inside for those two lunchtimes, that student will commit no more offences against that other student or anybody else while they're inside at lunchtime, it's absolutely true. But they've done nothing, we've done nothing apart from prepare them to, to behave poorly again. To, to mitigate the, the risk of that behaviour happening again when they're back in the general population. We're learning systems in schools, and what we need to do is to deploy approaches that allow our students to learn. And unfortunately, when we, def when we default to purely punitive ways of working, we teach the wrong stuff. Um, we, and it's because we generate such awful negative thinking in them. We need to generate a way of them knowing that they can fix problems up. And so when we work restoratively on the right hand side of this screen, we understand that our focus is split. We go from past to present to future. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, Ooh, this immediately sounds as though I, um, th this is now three times the work. Um, it's not. Uh, I say to you, don't launch educational CSI in a restorative model. How much, people ask me sometimes, how much of the story, how much of the past do I need to work on? And I have a very technical term for how much of the past you need. You need a gist. If I can get a gist between two students about what's gone roughly wrong, then I'm going to look to summarise that and I ask my summary question. So I'll hear two sides of the story. I say, right, so am I right here that you two went outside and were playing a game of handball, you disagreed about a point, some nasty words were said and it ended up getting a bit physical? And then my, here's my summary question and I'll start ask, is that about right? And if I get half a nod, I'm moving on. I've got enough of the past to start to move forward to the present and then to get these students to take action that will improve things for the future. The emphasis in a restorative model is not on blame but on harm. So if I ask a student, how do you think you made that person feel? I go, I don't know, sad? Yeah, I don't think so. Have a think about that. And then I stare into their souls <laughs> while they realise that I'm not about to rescue them by telling them how the other person feels. I'm going to actually demand that they think about it and put some thought into this because that's going to dictate an appropriate action. And deterrence is linked to this notion that you are trapped. You are trapped in a whole class, a whole school culture that says we value relationships so much that when something goes wrong in them, we will hold you personally accountable to fixing them. I, uh, when I was a principal, I asked my students once, and it was a fabulous opportunity, I had to open a new school. So I um, spent a fair bit of time early days getting around the classrooms and um, try, trying to meet students, because it's very strange to open a school with 350 students that you don't know. Um, so I was with my year one, two students one day, and I said to them, um, I made a horrible mistake. I said, what sort of a principal do you want? And they, they, we were, I was working in Darwin, so they told me they wanted a water slide. And, well, that's unlikely to happen. Um, so I'll tell you what, what I will be is the sort of principle that if you ever, ever spill a drink on our beautiful new school floors, I will never, ever clean it up for you. But I will take you to where all the mops are.
I said, could you talk to the person next to you about what you think that means? Why am I telling you that story? And they had a bit of a natter and blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay, everyone come back. And I said, could you put your hand up? Many hands went up. Um, if you can tell me what that means. And one year, one girl said to me, it means, Mr. Voigt, that if we make a mistake, we have to fix it, but you'll help. Spot on. Personal accountability. And my job is to provide the support to make sure that you get the help to get that job done. A couple of things that I want you to do today that I think will make an enormous difference for you in your work. Number one is if you want to change culture, you have to change language. Um, culture, and look, culture is one of those funny things. When I ask people, does the culture of a school matter? Everyone puts their hand up. And then when I ask people to keep their hand up because I'm going to randomly select one of them to come out the front in front of their colleagues and tell everyone what the correct definition of school culture is, they get nervous. <laughs> they don't know what to do. Uh, they don't know what to say. And it's weird that because if we're going to work on culture, we better get clear about what it is. So my working definition of culture is pretty simple. It's just that culture is a behavioural set. It's a behavioural sum total. But within that set, there are two groups, subsets, piles of behaviour, if you will. Um, there are the behaviours we encourage. There are the ones that we say, that's fantastic. I love that. Do it again. That's awesome. Have a sticker. Um, and there are the behaviours that we tolerate, um, perhaps because we haven't found the skill, the will or the time uh, to do that effectively. Um, I think that the best way to let students know that they have demonstrated in one pile or the other is to, a behaviour in one pile or the other is to use our words to do that, use our language. Language is critically important in terms of culture. Uh, I was actually I had the wonderful opportunity when I was a principal in Darwin and I had a, a school of 60 to 70% Indigenous students and the amazing um, Yalmay Yunapingu was one of my uh, employees. And Yalmay is an Indigenous leader in our country. And she was married to Mandawar Yunapingu, who was the lead singer of the Indian 1992 Australian of the Year. Um, Mandawar was, was, was ailing at that point, no, just not long before he passed away. Uh, he would come into Darwin for his treatment and um, would come and sit in my office. A lot of people don't know that Mandawar was also a school principal himself. And he would sit with me in my office and I would just get to listen to an Australian of the Year tell me how I should be principal of a school with lots of Indigenous kids. It was awesome. Um, and I shared with him a theory that I have around culture, that language is the one thing that is both the input and the output of culture. Um, the leaders in a school, and that's every adult that works there, the teachers specifically lead culture. Um, when they're intentional about the words they use, what happens is that on the other side of that culture, those words start to get exhibited by the young people that grow in that culture. Um, Mandawoy concurred. He said that one of the biggest challenges that's being faced by Indigenous people in Australia in the, ero in the erosion of the Indigenous culture, he said, is that we have, the, old, is, the problem is that the old people have stopped telling the stories. And that, that means that the young people are exhibiting the behaviours and the language of the culture that they're hearing in its absence. And that can be maybe even described best as you know, something like an American gangster culture. Um, so we need to get the right the, wor the words right to get the culture we're looking for in a school. The right words are what we call effective statements. Now, effective statements are, if I can put it really bluntly for you, say what you're already going to say, but chuck in a feelings word. That's it. That's all you need to do. Um, so for me, and it's mainly for our low-level behaviours that are positive and negative. So a low-level negative behaviour that might be seen with regularity in your school could be uh, a student dropping a piece of rubbish on the ground. Now, when I see a student drop rubbish on the ground in a school, I had a default that I bet many of you have. Um, and that default was to say, hey, pick that up. <laughs> um, I'm going to encourage you to spend just one second longer on that moment. Practice this. It took me a long time to make this my new default, but it now is. I don't ever even think, the, the words don't cross my mind to say to a student, hey, pick that up. When I see a student in your school say, uh, drop a piece of rubbish on the ground, I say, it disappoints me to see you do that, put it in the bin. And what happens when I, do, when I use that language is I connect the, the neocortex with the limbic system of the brain, the thinking centre with the feeling centre of the brain. Because if you're like 98% of the population who's not a sociopath, the word you heard me say loudest was disappointed. Um, it has an impact on us. We go, oh, right. Now, when that happens, I don't want to give you the impression that you have transformed the likelihood that that student will pick up the piece of paper when you say it. I think you've increased it. 
I think you've improved the likelihood that that happens. The other thing you've done though is incredibly long term. What you've done is you've reminded that student that their behaviour affects other people. That it ain't just about you. It's not about fighting for your patch. It's not about being right. It's not about trying to avoid responsibility. It's not about trying to try to trying to avoid effort. It's about understanding that when we make a behavioural choice, other people are impacted by it. And when you know and you care about the way other people are affected by your behaviour, you think twice before deploying that behaviour. Um, now what I want you to do is to think for a moment about how many opportunities you would have in a standard day to use an effective statement. How many chances at low level behaviours that are both positive and negative would you have to add an extra second and just say, throw in a feelings word to what you're already saying? Now most educators tell me that that could be as high as 100 or 200 opportunities a day. Um, if I stay modestly and say that there's 50, there's 50 opportunities, um, then in a school of even 30 staff, that's 1,500 opportunities every day to teach one student plus every single other student that heard you say it, that their behaviour affects other people. That's 7,500 opportunities a week. That's 75,000 opportunities a term. That's culture. And if you stop and think about how you teach empathy, um, you didn't learn it formally, you didn't learn it through a lesson, you didn't learn it through your parents sitting you down and giving you the empathy PowerPoint, you learned it by being trapped in a culture that just constantly reminded you that your behaviour affects other people until it becomes you. So you really need to get a strong focus on changing our language if we want to change the culture that our kids walk into every day. And the best place to start is just start with those effective statements. Make make games of it, you know, make contests of it with your colleagues if you can. Um, I had a, a couple of examples of a, a, a one teacher who has an effective word of the week. So that's 40 new words that she uses across the whole school year. And she says what she does when she walks in at the start of the week is she just starts using it. And, um, and the first student that says, that's the word, that's the feeling, that's the feelings word this week, wins a little prize. Um, I thought, I said, that's clever, I quite like that one. And she, um, and I walked into a classroom and I said, so what's the word this week? And she said, oh, I'm not telling you. And I went, okay. So I sat with some students and I said, do you know what the word is this week? And they said, yeah, we, we know what it is. And I said, what is it? And I said, she's flabbergasted about everything. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's good. And I looked across at this teacher and she said, you wait till next week when I'm flummoxed. I went, oh, wow, that's good. I went to another teacher who was a little sick of her students going from zero to angry too quickly. And so she said, what, do I, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach them that, they, that anger's not binary. You know, you're not either angry or not angry, that there's a whole heap of words in between. She's going to teach them that anger is a range. And she taught them annoyed and she taught them frustrated and she taught them infuriated. And when I got to her classroom, she was teaching them the word for the smallest possible amount of anger that you can feel. And I said, so I thought that's interesting because in my head I couldn't come up with what that word was. And um, it took me a while, a bit of grappling. I said, oh, I'm really sorry. I said, hey, I can't work out what word is that you're going to teach the kids today. And she said, we're teaching them at the moment how you get miffed. I thought, oh, that's clever. I walked in and you were a year two boy um, in the class. I walked up to him and I said, so how do you get miffed? And he goes, it's like this. He goes, if someone walks up past your table and they knock a pen on the ground, you just look at it and you go, mm, but I'll be all right. And I thought, that's magic. And, and then I had a little moment where I thought, that's not just magic, that's profound. Imagine what that does to that school if every year two student in her care, particularly the males, understands when they get to year three, four, five, six, that there are certain things, such as someone knocking a pen on the ground, that you don't need to fly into range or rage around, that you can just be miffed about it. I thought that's actually quite uh, the big deal. Um, play with it, come up with all sorts of creative ways to use it, but don't relent on it. Because if eventually you do, you change the entire culture of your school. It seems such a small thing, doesn't it? Um, when it comes to working restoratively, as I hope you're seeing here, the emphasis between the restorative practice and the restorative justice notion. When you choose this little practice and make a difference and, and, and stick with it, you do some truly awesome stuff. And then the last thing I want to do today is talk about um, changing our practice in terms of using circles. 
Um, and circles for me have been, just as I, as I showed you in that first picture today, such a powerful thing for me because they genuinely position me as doing education with the students rather than doing it to them. Showed you some year six students at the start there. The students that you can see in this picture are preps, uh, the youngest possible students. And so what I want you to understand around circles is that you can use them for a variety of purposes. Um, you can use them to check in. So that's a way of um, making the focus of a circle the present. You can say, well, I want to know is where you're at right now. A year 10 teacher that I work with here in, um, in Victoria, she teaches in a pretty tough part of the world in Footscray. And I asked her one day, could you tell me about your students? And she said, Adam, let's just say they have burgeoning careers in chemical distribution. And I went, right, okay. That's an interesting way of describing them. Um, but she said that she is committed to check-in circles where as they walk in at the start of the week to see her for the first time, she says, quickly, guys, just stand in a circle for a moment. Just put your heads down for a minute. I want you to think of two words that tell me the truth about how you're feeling today. Could be too positive. Could be too negative and they could even because you're emotionally intelligent young people be one of both because it's possible to be interested but hungry at the same time i'll give you 10 seconds of thinking time think of what your two words are and then she says go and they just fly around the circle as she says her record is 30 is 41 seconds she can get around an entire class in 41 seconds and she has taken what she calls her social and emotional dipstick. She's able to understand right then and there what's going on with her class. If one or two students, she says her average is two, will say something interesting. She said if someone says something interesting, she walks over and she does the quick past, present, future. Hey, what was that all about? So how are you feeling now? Anything I can do to help? And she said for 60 or 70% of her students, she said they actually don't want her to fix anything. You know, they, they, she, they know and she knows that they can't fix the fact that they had a really dodgy weekend and a big argument with their parents and she hasn't, and they haven't had breakfast this morning. They just wanted to know. They just wanted to ask, which is really important. So circle type one is that you can check in. Circle type two is you can check out. So on a, maybe on a Friday Arvo, if you're a uh, primary teacher or a home care or a pastoral care teacher in a secondary environment, it might be Friday morning. The last time you see your students that you're connected with uh, from a wellbeing or pastoral perspective, then what you might like to do is just ask them a question about the past. So the focus of the check-in circle is the present, focus of the check-out is the past. And what you might like to do is to just say, hey, um, one of our values in our school is respect. Um, and I'm wondering if you could have a quick chat with the person next to you while we're standing in a circle about a time this week that you saw someone demonstrate respect. And a, little, a, little, a little bit of a chat about it. You might share a couple. Oh, good. Okay, I've noticed there's still a couple of minutes to the bell. Um, I'm wondering if you could also have a chat with the person next to you about somebody that you should have shown more respect to this week and what you're going to do about that next week. So you're just starting to flip the circle from being about the past to being about the future. Um, and they can talk about those concepts in a way that doesn't get them into trouble but plans for a better outcome next time around. You're starting to make your values behavioural when you use them in checkout circles, which is really exciting because values posted up on a wall as a mural or made into a poster or turned into a video without a behavioural um, connection made to them for your students ain't going to work. You can run preparation circles, which is about you might have an excursion or a, or a, um, a camp that you're about to go on. You can establish how you want to feel and what behaviours will get you that. Um, you can have response circles where you can talk about how the camp or the excursion went, or you can even have response circles to talk about things that you didn't plan for or prepare for. So, you know, I remember running response circles when we had a, a student who uh, unfortunately lost her mum in the Bali bombings. I remember running response circles when we had the students come in the day of the September, after the September 11 bombings. So um, we had response circles when we had a student in our class break both of his ankles in a BMX accident. Let's respond. That's no good. Let's respond, let's work this out together, what our plan of action is going forward. And then there's the final circle, which is I, which I call learning circles. Um, you know, I, I feel like I should love my circles evenly, but I, I don't. Uh, learning circles are undoubtedly my favourite child. Um, because when I allow a learning circle like you can see on the screen here where I'm running a, a session around anger with prep students, when you allow circles, uh, by, when, you, when you start to impact your positioning, when you let this restorative theory impact your instructional model, some amazingly cool stuff starts to happen. One is, as you can see on the screen, as I mentioned before, the engagement levels go up. And the real only, only real rule around that is that whatever they're doing, you're doing. 
So if we need to talk about something for a little while, grab a chair, guys. Let's sit in a circle. If you've got an early childhood class, they might be comfortable sitting on the floor. If you've got a senior secondary class, they might be more comfortable standing up to do a quick circle to establish a new, a new, a new theme that you've uh, you've discovered within a Shakespearean text that's going to be on their VCE exam at the end of the year. Um, but I can guarantee you this, that if you do what they're doing, and in this circle you can see me lying on my belly, uh, it takes a bit of work for me to get under my belly, but the students are lying on their belly. I'm not doing anything magical here. My drawing skills clearly are quite, um, are, are quite average. Um, so, but what I love about this picture is the engagement level of the students. Uh, what I love about it less is that it's letting me know about the train wreck that is my hair, but I figure if I can't see it, it's not happening. I want you to use your circles less often. I want you to do short ones. Sorry, I want you to do the more often short ones. And I think that you'll get a really great response if you decide to do them that way. By doing short ones, you might see that you need a code word. I taught this one day uh, with a school in the Northern Territory, a fabulous teacher um, who was a graduate teacher with a really tough, really, really tricky little class. And he realised that by listening to the students coming in at the start of the day, he had a code word for them, and that was Spider-Man. I wanted to show you a incredibly brief video of, um, of Dan in action with his year one, two class and what happens when he says Spider-Man in the classroom. Spider-Man. Love how you got your hands behind your back, Zach. Beautiful. Really well done. Okay, in the last... I think what you noticed in that 14 second video is that the kids were able to transition to a place where learning's more likely, where instruction's more effective. You've got two or three effective statements in there as the students came in because you get to thank and congratulate them for de demonstrating positive behaviour and the kids are going to get it, which means that the likelihood of them experiencing the shame associated with failure is reduced and the likelihood of them succeeding and him being able to build up on that success is increased. I think that video, as short as it is, is why I practice restoratively. Hey, um, there's my contact details. I know Jody wants to jump in here and um, ask yeah. a couple of questions, give you the chance to answer some questions as well, ask some questions too. But um, that's um, that's me. And um, if we can help you at all with what you, your teaching, your classroom, your school is looking to achieve, happy to do that. Uh, look. Jody, what do you reckon? Thank you so very much for your time and sharing not only your, your expertise, but all of the experience that you've had working personally with schools and sharing for us the examples. I think it, it really shows how restorative practices work in action and how teachers can adopt these practices and weave them into the fabric of their classes rather than, rather than uh, having an expectation that it might take extra time or or require um, more commitment or resources from them. And it's, it's really just seems such an obvious way to approach, uh, approach these kinds of challenges. And uh, I know I've taken a lot from, from your uh, webinar today and I, I know that everyone here will have as well. Um, we haven't had any, any questions come through. I, I, you, you're so chock full of information and examples in your webinars. I think you've left I everybody feeling. Really, did I? <laughs> <laughs> But um, I really do, you know, certainly I'll keep the questions uh, box open for another moment or so, but certainly, you know, please, I, I'd encourage you to uh, take a look at uh, the resources that Adam has available and, and contact Adam if you, you're uh, after the extra resources that he mentioned at the start. And, um, you know, Adam, I'm, I'm really grateful for you taking the time to share to share with us your um, your experience and, and uh, your expertise and wondered if there's anything else that you'd like to add before we sort of finish up. Looks like looks like you've um, ticked all the boxes today, so um, we'll close the questions down. Yeah, uh, look, that, I, I'm absolutely fine. I just want people to know exactly. I want to I want to reiterate what you were saying there, Jody. That rest practicing restoratively is not something that you need to find more time for. Um, I, I always advocate that I I would never advocate to a teacher that they practice restoratively if it doesn't do two things for them. Um, number one is that it should create more time for them. There's a myth around restorative practices that it takes too long to stop and answer, ask all these questions or to get the kids in a circle. And there's ways we can mitigate that so that it saves you time. Um, and the other thing is that people tell me about restorative practices, oh, it doesn't work because it's too soft. Um, well, I can tell you now that when 
I let a student know that their behaviour um, has really let me down. There's a little effective statement that can work just as strongly as disappointed or frustrated. Um, and when I let a student know that their behaviour has really made me proud or has really excited me, then it has a genuine impact on that student. Um, it's heavy. It's a big deal to them. Um, and for a lot of our kids that we're trying to get traction with who give us a lot of trouble, um, who are the hardest to get traction with, um, they've seen off detentions. They've seen off punishments. Um, they may have even, you know, caught some uh, really nasty stuff at home. Uh, you can't punish your way to success with them. Um, what we've got to do is create an opportunity to have impact with them. And those words, that language, genuinely is confronting for them. It's difficult for them. But in a restorative model, we say we get that. And now our job is to help you not feel like that anymore. We want you to do something positive so that we can thank and congratulate you and tell you what an awesome problem solver you are. So, um, so restorative practices for me dispels, uh, done well, dispels those two myths. And as I mentioned before, makes teachers feel more effective and less stressed, which I reckon is a good thing. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, uh, I just thought I would check the questions and, and just, just to let you know, there's, there's not a question, but a thank you. Uh, one of our, our educators uh, on the webinar this afternoon, Beth, had said this talk was really practical and makes it easy to have uh, some real takeaways, some really defined takeaways. So thank you for sharing your gratitude, Beth. That's really appreciated. And uh, I really echo, echo your sentiments. Well, um, Adam, I'd like to say thank you again. I really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, very, very grateful for all that you've shared with us this afternoon. My pleasure, Jodie. No problem at all. Thanks so much.